Let me officially say good morning to everybody and welcome to um, our fifth installment of what we're calling the SIP and Secure Security Series um, with Lincoln IT. Today we have Fortinet with us and I'm really excited. Um, Mike Weir has prepared a 40 adventure for us. So I hope everybody's ready because uh, there will be some audience directiveness, if you will. So, um, Mike, I want to thank you and the Fortinet team for being with, here with us this morning, and um, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. Thank you, Anne-Marie. I may call on you occasionally to call on who you want to answer my questions, if that's okay. Uh-oh. Um, okay. <laughs> I don't want it to be my <laughs> fault, is basically what I'm saying. Great. Um, absolutely. Happy to support however I can. Awesome. All right. Cool. Yeah, so as Anne-Marie said, my name is Michael Weir. I'm NSC7 certified Fortinet Technical Account Manager. And I am here to present this to you today. And rather than make your eyes bleed with just a roll through a PowerPoint, I want this to be a choose your own adventure. Now, if you remember these books from your junior high library, what it is is you start and you get to a page and the page says, if you choose this, go that way. If you choose this, go that way. And then so on and so forth. And Telltale Games has evolved that to an art for any gamers that are out there. Uh, but we're going to have four sections to talk about today. And anywhere in this, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. I do have about a one-second delay. So if I start to bowl over your question, just, uh, you know, just ask anyway. So we have four sections. We have a welcome, which is going to be a quick forward net brand overview. A section on compliance. How do I help people comply? Work from anywhere. How do I pe help people work in remote or returning? And ransomware, how, how do I protect people from ransomware? So... Uh, with that, Anne-Marie, would you like to choose someone to choose the first section we're going to talk about? Um, sure. So I'm just looking at a name here. Um, Leonid, are you with us? Okay. Um, why don't we go down a little bit further? I saw, I saw my friend Nazim. Naz, can we call on you? Nobody wants to unmute today. Well, Anne-Marie, why don't we use you as an example then? Which one would you like to do first? Well, I feel like we have to start with a welcome, right? Otherwise, that would be, we can't do the welcome in the middle. I think that would be a little bit confusing. So why don't we start there, Mike, and give everybody a chance to kind of think where they want to go after that. All right, awesome. So this is the only one of no internal choose your adventure choices. So you chose the lame one. This is just a quick little bit of background on Fortinet and where they fit. So we're going to talk about some third-party publications here. We can use things from Fortinet. Obviously, I like Fortinet, but I think it's more powerful to see someone else's words on the subject. So first, let's talk about Gartner and their UTM leader quadrant. So Gartner has ranked Fortinet in the leader quadrant for UTM and GFW, what they've called it over the years, for 10 consecutive years. And you can see our friends up there. Take note of those names for a second. Our other people that are in our leader quadrant, maybe you could call them our arch rivals or something like that, because Fortinet is actually in a second leader quadrant relevant to things that are going on today, and that is SD-WAN. And you'll notice some of our friends from the previous leader quadrant are there, but the, we've made some serious headway in putting ourselves very well positioned in this. And we have the upside that our SD-WAN device is also our firewall device, which is the FortiGate. So that's a nice unification of things right there. One box, no extra licenses, get it done nice and easy. And then if we look across to the very scientific side of things in NSS Labs, so this is different areas of recommendation. Uh, and this is for different products, like you know, you got your breach prevention systems, your data center IPS, all these different things. Fortinet is recommended across nine categories. And then there's our friends in the leader quadrant, the other three brands whose names I won't say. Uh, you can see that we have nine and we're looking at four, three, and two. So that's a little bit of third party stuff. Quick thing on some of the first party stuff. Fortinet, people think of the FortiGate and that's reasonable. FortiGate's a little under half of all of our uh, units shipped. But we have a whole ecosystem of different products, which you can see up there. And these products up here are all ones that share security intelligence. 
So, in other words, if there's a threat that happens at one, then it tells the others. So, if you've got a four to gate up there, and there's a, a threat that it sends to your sends to four to sandbox, which gets identified as a zero day, the four to sandbox will make a micro definition. We'll send it out to the four to gate. We'll also send it out to your four to client, um, your uh, four to ADC, your four to web, your four to mail, all the other relevant things in your system. So, you've got a very unified set of protection across uh, the entire attack surface. And having one unified set of protection and having one generally single pane, uh, single pane management source for all of the major products means less chance to make mistakes. And we're humans. We make mistakes. I'm not trying to insult any of you. But when we make things simple and we streamline things, we make less mistakes. Besides the fact that we're ridiculously accurate and I think we're the best in the world. So that is your 30-second intro. Well, so I don't know how we're going to get people to volunteer, Mike, when you said my choice was lame. But um, <laughs> we promise that we won't call out anybody else. So, um, all right. So we have a request. Let's go to compliance. Thank you very much, Christian. I appreciate your participation. I opened it up in the chat. So, uh, you know, I realize you may be in like a, a noisy coffee shop or somebody said earlier their dog was howling at the wind. So, Maybe asking people to come off mute is just a little bit too much. So please use the chat. We want to hear from you. We want to guide this presentation to your liking. So uh, where are we going next on the adventure, Mike? I guess we're going to compliance. Let's head up compliance. Okay. So compliance is a big word. And it's something that's coming up into play. There's 38 states that in the past year and a half, give or take, have passed some kind of new cyber compliance law. And when we look at those laws, there's three things that people generally think. First thing is they think confusing. Each law or regulation has its own peculiarities, and they're not usually written in industry language because they're usually not written by industry professionals. They're written under the advisement of them. But in some sense, we've got to do decoding to figure out what it's actually saying. They're also very complicated, and they're full of if-then scenarios. And sort of like a choose your own adventure book, if you've got enough if-thens, you know, you've ended up with hundreds and hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of different com uh, different combinations at the end to try to make sense of. And based on the first two, a lot of people say, um, is it ignorable? Not really ignorable, but some businesses treat them this way. I encourage you not to do that. Um, and then if we look at a general thing overall, the new rules that have come out, Compliance, I guess this is a Daft Punk, Punk reference. Compliance is four different things. It's bigger, faster, stronger, harder. The new laws, the definition of a breach and uh, definition of data are much more expansive. And keep in mind, I'm not a lawyer here. Uh, they're stronger. The penalties are easier to give out even for minor breaches. In some states, even username and password combinations now count as uh, personally protected, personally identifiable information. So they're the most common thing leaked. Used to be uh, there wasn't any penalty for that. Now in some states, there is. They're also faster. Um, notification requirements on even minor breaches have to happen faster. The average time to detection of a breach, depending on your industry that you're in, ranges anywhere from 30 to 120 days. Now some states require a 14-day window for notice from the event. So that's becoming a pain. And there's penalties if you don't do that, too. And then harder. Harder in the sense that it's not just documenting what happened. You have to document your response plan too, saying, if this happens, this is what I'm going to do. Because if somebody looks back and says, hey, you took the appropriate precautions, that's going to look a lot better when it comes time to see if we're meeting out any punishment. And eh, I just, I threw in a, you know, a home, a home router or something I got from my cable company and just kind of let it, let it sit and hope for the best, right? People aren't going to necessarily like that answer. And I encourage you to think about this carefully because, um, in terms of compliance, 63% of businesses of 500 employees or less don't take basic security precautions. Since you're here, I'm assuming it means you're not in that 63%. So that statistic's not as relevant to you. But what probably is relevant to you is that 60% of businesses of 500 employees or less who suffer an attack close within six months. Uh, and that's a pretty shocking number when you stop and think about it. It's a pretty fast turnaround for crash. And about half of all businesses of 500 employees or less suffer a breach, and almost three quarters of them think they're safe. Now, think about those physics together. We've got 75% thinking they're safe, but 63% not taking security precautions. You'll understand there's some cognitive difference here. So when it comes to compliance, are we going to ignore it, or are we going to protect ourselves from these compliance issues? Uh, can I have a choice whether someone wants to ignore or protect? This is the choose your own adventure part. Also, I can't see the chat, Anne-Marie, so if you could prompt me if somebody has said ignore or protect. 
I was on mute. Sorry. We got to ignore. All right. So let's ignore the problem completely. That is what, what I tend to do on some of the things in my house, such as uh, ignore the tiling in my bathroom until my wall actually collapsed. So this is the way something can go. And these are all real tools I've put in here. Um, NSC7 is a relatively high certification. I'm also studying for my computer hacker forensics investigator right now, and I've got a Kali Linux machine next to me so I can verify that these techniques are real. Um, let's say you get a phishing email. It's got a malicious link. Install something called PyXfil. Py standing for Python. Xfil, of course, standing for exfiltration. So a hacker takes that malicious link and uses PyXfil to send customer data to an external server they have set up, more than likely behind some kinds of anonymization, and takes that data and sells it. Believe it or not, data is such an easily and frequently transferable thing in various dark web sources that it even has going rates. So you can estimate based on what you get, how much you're gonna, money you're going to get out of it. And if you look at it from that perspective, one big splash or a thousand tiny drops fill a bucket. People are going to take the path of least resistance and try to get those thousand tiny drops if those thousand tiny drops are easy to get. But then here's the thing. Both sides get caught, so data exfiltration is discovered by authorities, and fines are imposed. Now, besides just fines, there's other costs to think about here. There's brand reputation costs. There is remediation costs. There is costs for new equipment, if you have that out there. There's fines, especially in Europe. The fines will come out of your gross profit, or sometimes even your gross revenues. They can be tremendous. And it's worth noting European standards, in a lot of cases, apply to the location of the user, not to the location of the website. So you might have to comply with that. And then, bye-bye course is the end. Bye bye. 60% of breach businesses of roughly 500 close within six months. I am unfortunately having to say that is game over. So let's see what would have happened if you chose and protect. This is a uh, think of this back in the day is like when you went to the good ending of the choose your own adventure book to try and find out what would actually happen and try to read backwards. So here are some things I would say when it comes to compliance. Um, let's say you get that phishing email and you have mail protection like FortiMail. It filters out the phishing email. But let's say you don't have FortiMail. We're talking about layer protection from FortiNet. So let's say you have FortiGate or FortiWeb in place and somehow this PyXFIL gets in there. They're gonna, they have data leak prevention in them, so it's going to prevent data from leaving the network. It's gonna, you can set up a policy saying, A, these files can't leave, or B, if this many leaves at this rate over this time, we're going to block it. Then we can remediate. So we've got a Ford Analyzer SOC. Forensics show us how this happened and how to stop it in the future. We patch any holes that we see. By this time, it's bye-bye to the hackers because our environment is hardened and attacks are less likely to succeed in the future. You'll notice there are multiple places in here we could stop this attack, and that's a good thing because uh, if you have a front door, if people, some people say, oh, i got a firewall. Well, if you have a front door and you lock it, why do you still have a bathroom door? Right? Anyway. So it's time to shoot over to the next level. But before I go there, I do want to give a quick uh, summary of the products we talked about here. And I believe this, if this isn't in your hands yet, it will be shortly. Um, the FortiMail, FortiGate, FortiWeb, and FortiAnalyze or SOC. This is just a brief description of what each of them does. As I said, I think this is coming to you shortly. If it's not there already, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or uh, anybody at Lincoln. You know they know a lot. So It's not in their hands yet, Mike. So um, It will be, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. Thanks for, uh, you can thank me later for throwing you under the bus there. Uh, but yeah, here's the products I'm I just talked about. I'm keeping score, Mike. It's a game, right? I'm keeping score. <laughs> oh, man. Not only did I say you chose the least interesting section, now I threw you under the bus too, man. This is not a good start. All right. Back home. So we have two more. We have work from anywhere and we have ransomware. Can I have somebody make a choice next? All right, so I'm going to the chat. I'd love some. Um, I'd love some input from the audience because I, I, remember my choices are lame. So maybe someone other than a Fortinet person. Uh, work from anywhere. Great. Okay, awesome. So how do we help our customers or our users, however you want to phrase it? How do we help them work from anywhere, or when they're even returning to the office? So. This is a unique situation. I'm not going to go on a big tangent about new normal and all that. I'm sure you'll hear that about 15 times a day. But what I am going to talk about is some statistics related to it. And if you can't tell, I'm someone who likes numbers. So roughly 60% of workers nationwide work remote at this point, either summer all the time. And what's more shocking about that, though, is 80% of employees now say they wouldn't work for a company that didn't have a flexible work policy. Now, obviously, there are some companies where it's impossible to do so. 
But it's sort of like once you get a taste of something, you're like, yeah, you know, that's actually not a bad idea. And that leads us to our other statistic here. Um, it's, this is a one-third, one-third, one-third thing. One-third of workers didn't care. But one-third of remote workers wish they could return to the office. But another third of remote workers don't want to return to the office. They like working from home. They want to stay there forever. So obviously, if you look at these stats, work from anywhere isn't something that's just going to end when we get out of our current situation. It's a, it's a new variable we've introduced uh, to what's probably going to be permanent in our, in our business environment. So work from anywhere. Can I have a uh, protect or ignore chosen for me? Okay, I'm looking at the chat. I'm, I'm guessing we're going to ignore again, but I wish somebody would just tell me that for sure. Hey, you know what? If they don't answer, I count that as ignoring. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so here, here's some uh, interesting scenarios we can go over. Once again, I can verify you, verify to you that these are all possibilities. Um, this one is probably of the more remote of the possibilities, but I want you to think about if you have teenage neighbors, how easy something like this could happen, and the fact that roughly a quarter of all teenagers out there these days are cyber literate enough to be able to do something like this. So let's say you're working from home or office over a wireless connection. You've got a nosy neighbor. A uh, nosy neighbor from your competitor or someone who wants to leverage selling your information. Uh, they start using your Wi-Fi and realize you're sending valuable information. Now this is called man in the middle. When they say, all right, I can start intercepting what's coming to this, coming over this Wi-Fi, what's going to happen on this access point. So then your nosy neighbor uh, intercepts, sells, uses whatever this corporate information, this private information you have. What do you know? Maybe it's your credit card. Maybe it's all of your customers' credit cards. You know, any, anything that's going back and forth over that connection is now in the hands of somebody else. And then our normal buy-buy that you've got a 60% chance of closing within six months if you're a small business to whom this happens. And unfortunately, that leads us to our next game over. Should you have chosen to protect, there's actually a couple of different scenarios here. Because work from home is a very nuanced thing, and, and it can be implemented in a very large number of ways, all of which are effective, I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios here. But that means I'm going to go through them a little faster. So work from anywhere, um, this is... Business as usual, we're still working from home or office or a wireless connection, but let's say we're using a Forta client VPN. So the VPN is, of course, encrypting all data that's going over it. So even if there is that man in the middle, the data they collect is gibberish. It's unusable. It's just random. To what to them will appear to be random characters. And that means the attack is unsuccessful. That's the most common way people are protecting themselves these days. But there's obviously other ways to do it, and there's holes in this. Um, so I have to say, wait, there's more. So let's say we're working from anywhere now, and um, we say, all right, we want to stop things, not just over going the VPN, but we want to stop things going anywhere in the network from being stolen. So we could say we have a Forta AP and a root Forta gate that detect and block wireless intrusion attempts through reverse path forwarding or wireless intrusion detection systems. It's worth noting that you can actually send your employees home with Fortnet access points, and they'll have their corporate SSID right there. It'll do a secure tunnel back to the corporate office. It's given, I've been in the game for a while, and it's so much easier than it used to be. It's, it's you know, people won't even notice the difference. Go in, plug it in. It's already pre-set up, controlled, deployed. It's great. And then, once again, the man in the middle of the neighbor is locked out, and we have another bye-bye to their attack. But wait, there's more. So now, this is a scenario that's going to become, at least in my opinion, going to become very, very frequent soon, which is workers, they work from home or office over a wired connection with a compromised device. Uh, we all know people somewhere in organizations that have poor uh, web hygiene policies. Obviously, it's not any of you, but we all know those people are out there. So we have in the FortiGate, there's security policies, especially if you have a Forti switch they can block a device at the switchboard. It doesn't have to wait for things to start going through the network or crossing laterally, all these things. Combine it with Forta client and things that can block right at the switchboard label, which means our man in the middle neighbor, this time being man in the middle in the sense that they're on your premises between your data and you, is locked out. As soon as they try to get in, they're quarantined or they're tossed. This means we have an unsuccessful attack, which means you get to proceed to the next level. And just a quick overview of those products we talked about. Forta Client, Forta Switch, and Forta AP. You might say, we talked about Forta Gate too. Well, yeah, it was on the last one. I'm not going to double up and make you guys read the whole time. I'm not teaching study, study skills in seventh grade here. We have the Forta Client, 
which is VPN connectivity, but it's also your next generation antivirus, ATP, uh, vulnerability scanning, uh, software inventories, all those sort of things. Forta Switch, which provides your port-based security, conveniently enough controlled through a single interface uh, right off the FortiGate's GUI, so you don't even have to click around, don't have to go on anything second, it's right there. And then your Forta AV, also controlled by the FortiGate's on that same single pane for setup. And then remote applications, you can take them off-site and still have them that be controlled by that FortiGate. So now you've got a single pane for people all over the world for when they're trying to use that horribly insecure hotel Wi-Fi. Okay. So, Mike, I just want to give you a little bit of feedback from the from the chat box. So, a sure. um, little bit of a challenge on the um, unprotected Wi-Fi. Um, I did clarify for Henry that it was that was the ignore scenario, but uh, he thought it was a little bit too simplistic. Uh, the scenario of the, um, mm -hmm. the teenager next door getting into the Wi-Fi um, and sure. the challenges, you know, obviously with today's security, that who's going to connect without some sort of VPN or a VDI interface? And that strong passwords are used for most Wi-Fi WAP2 connections. Um, so now too, so I don't know what else is coming, but I just wanted to share that feedback with you since you can't see it. No, that's fine. I'll, I'll actually give an answer to that. So I intentionally simplified that scenario a little bit. What I'd bring it out to is this, that for people who are cyber savvy, uh, especially if you live in a neighborhood where there's you're surrounded by people who would fall into this category, people are cyber savvy and know what to do with that kind of knowledge. Think college students or high school students. You can get a pineapple for $80 off Amazon, and that'll it becomes a man in the middle quite easily. It'll take your SSID and it'll rebroadcast it stronger. Um, if you go online, I'm not going to go through them all right now, but uh, WPA 2 and 3 have relatively glaring flaws that are constantly being patched in and out. And as security professionals, we're always playing a little bit of a catch-up game simply because think of it like cops and robbers. You don't know what a robber is going to rob next. You just try to make good predictions and try to block that. So that's entirely possible. And I appreciate what you said about strong passwords and that kind of thing. And I wish I could say that everybody followed those, but the thing is, a lot of people don't. So credit to you and your organization for actually practicing good hygiene there. But unfortunately, that's not something that's very widespread. So, um, All right. So let's, uh, Henry, we'll come back to the last comment um, after the, the next section, if that's okay with you. All right. Cool. So we're just going to hit up ransomware now because it's the one we haven't hit up. I can't really make you have a choice here. So ransomware. Yeah, this has been... Everybody's always saying, oh, ransomware is going up, ransomware is going up, and it's almost become background noise because we hear about ransomware so frequently. It's been years that we've had this ransomware problem going on. But every, uh, every I guess I would say every event is some kind of new opportunity, and uh, malactors very astutely surmised that people would be more likely to click on certain kinds of emails and that kind of thing when there is a pandemic going on. So there's actually been a 350% increase in overall cyber attacks with COVID-19 going on and a 72% increase in specifically ransomware attacks with COVID going on. Uh, some of these, there's actually a website out there. I'll have to look it up later. I forgot to write down what the name was, but the entire purpose of it is to track COVID scam apps and websites and things like that and post their names so you don't go to them uh, just because there's so many out there right now. And personally, I think ransomware is in most scenarios the final boss of malware this is the one where you either you know either get def you defeat it and win the game or this is the end of everything so ransomware we're going to ignore or protect i'm going to take we that always ignore first or can we protect first you, can, you can protect first win and then see what would have happened had you ignored it we can do that oh no we can ignore from the audience oh oh we got sorry. ignore that's yes, fine. Uh, not requested we ignore. All right, we're going to ignore that threat then. So ransomware at this point can be bought as a package. There's not a lot of thought necessarily needs to go into it. The delivery is where the, um, where the effort has to come in. And the two most frequent ways for three most frequent ways are drive-by downloads, office documents, and PDFs are the three most common ways to deliver ransomware these days. And um, you can do things with file forking and things along those lines to easily embed a malicious script in an office document. Uh, Excel is relatively frequent because we all see those little yellow warning bars and we all just click them because we want them to go away oftentimes without reading them. And when I say all, I'm not talking about specifically people that are here. I'm talking about in a general sense, this is a frequent way attacks are carried out. So we install Ryuk off that, and it calls back to its C2 server, and that says, hey, it's time to spread. 
And when it gets that signal from the command and control saying it's time to spread, it starts encrypting anything it can find. And then uh, the 60% of breach businesses clo closing is especially severe in this case because not only do you have to do remediation in the sense of you know uh, fixing your environment, trying to gain customer confidence back. In this case, you're trying to do that while also trying to recover from all the business data that may have been locked out. And it's worth noting that we're in an era now of delayed ransomware, too. We're on somewhere that waits 30, 60, 90 days, a week, two weeks, things along those lines, where it, the uh, the point of doing that is so that it'll get into your backups as well. The idea being when you um, back up and restore, you and they get ransomware again. I'm not going to name any names, but uh, I will say I'm from the Buffalo area, and there was a business in this area that was ransomware twice in 14 days for that very reason. It activated. Uh, they just dumped everything and installed their backups. When they installed their backups, it was in there and it activated again. So interesting loop you can enter there. Sort of like, a, I don't know, what's that? Say like a Terminator, how you're always going back and forth, and the movies try to defeat the same people over and over again. Anyway, when you get ransomware, it is pretty much game over. But let's see what happens if you protect. So there's a couple of different ways you could protect from ransomware, and as always, it's best to have multiple layers. Uh, phishing email is the most common way to deliver ransomware because people are generally the flaw in any system. And there's different ways we could quarantine the infection. So we could have FortiGate, FortiClient, or FortiAnalyzer with IOC quarantine the infected client. Uh, if you have those strings combined together, it will actually do it automated. So it'll do it in milliseconds instead of sending you an alert saying, hey, you should quarantine this person. Or instead of the firewall saying, hey, we, gotta, we have a call out. We're going to block the call out and not look into the reason it's happening. This will automatically quarantine the client. And then... Uh, the kind of the, the pinnacle, the halo product of endpoint protection from Fortinet is FortiEDR. FortiEDR kills processes before they start. It's actually at the kernel level, snapshotting every new session, snapshotting every new process, that kind of thing. So if it detects that a ransomware attack is going to happen, it will stop that process and just say, hey, we killed this process for you. It's not like other uh, EDR vendors who, you know, they plant decoy files or they watch things that are frequently encrypted to see if one of those things gets encrypted. Obviously, when you've got something like that that's based on static variables, people start to find ways to get around it. So here, Forti EDR is acting on the kernel level. So the attack is unsuccessful, and any of these things that found it will then make a micro-update to send out to the rest of the fabric in the future so you can't get hit by the same thing a second time. And Fortinet's products are all uh, powered by FortiGuard Labs, and they have a thing on there that tells how long it's been since they pushed out their last update. If you look at the IPS updates on the FortiGates, they're pushed out usually once every four to five minutes at, at longest, you know, once every couple hours. So this is a very rapid turnaround for things. You have blocked things, so now you win. And brief overview of the products we just talked about. Uh, FortiMail is actually our second oldest product behind FortiGate, so it's a very mature solution there. Um, over 100 million mailboxes are protected by it right now. It's got some cool features called content disarm and reconstruction, where let's say a PDF comes to you and the uh, script is in, say, a text handler. It's pulling in a caption for an image or something like that. It'll pull out that little bit of uh, bad code and replace it with a paste placeholder. So that picture is gone. Now there's a placeholder picture there. And the document still goes through. It isn't destroyed. So you're losing your infection, but you're not losing your valuable data. Ford Client and Ford Analyzer, of course, we've talked about those before, and they're a nice synergy right there. But this is just a little more on our cooperation. And, of course, 40 EDR um, is pre and post, and actually since it's next generation antivirus too, during infection protection. But it's also proactive in the sense that it tries to map and shrink your attack surface, uh, diffuses things for execution, and it does have playbook and kind of like a SOAR. And one thing I didn't put on here, it also has virtual patching. So if there's a known issue, it will... Um, perform actions inside the kernel to act as though that patch would have been applied. So, we've gone through all the rounds of the game. That means it's time to round it out. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to flip a little bit. You're going to see a little flicker on my screen because I'm going to pull up the chat so I can see what's actually going on here and answer any questions that have been uh, pulled up. Let's see what we got here. Swing it down. Alliance. Yeah, thank you. Ignore, ignore, ignore. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah. So on the wireless thing um, about VPN or VDI interface or WAP2 or, you know, WFA or whatever, you know, all these things, it would be great if people used them. However, statistically speaking, people don't. And I'm guessing because you said it in this way, it means you are using that, which is good. But as I said, statistically speaking, people don't. And there's also holes and cracks in, in, in that all over the place. Like, we know, we, the old zero-digit crack, which has been patched. But there's always new ones. Right. Let's see. Yeah, Aruba does it too. I mean, there's no denying that. We actually have integration with... This is, this is an important point. Um, Fortinet has integration with 120 other vendors as security fabric partners, which means they in some way connect with our security operations. So for Aruba, for example, we have an integration, pre-built integration with ClearPass, if that's something you're using and you still want to pull things together. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, click the link. The CEO needs that $500 Google Play card. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a... That's a totally different thing right now. Uh, yeah, let's just let's put it this way. Um, as a demonstration I'm doing later, I'm going to do a live phishing demo with something called Blackfish. And Blackfish, I installed it and got it up and running, starting from a blank hard disk, running off a live USB Cali on it. Um, I think it was took me maybe five minutes to get a good phishing attack going. Copied into something that looked like a legitimate email. There you go. Um, and it's worth saying, too, that you, you really have to have some kind of protection that's behavioral and intelligent. And, you know, obviously sandboxing fulfills some of that because most of these malware domains you're looking at have been around for a few hours, if that. Because otherwise, it's too easy to add them to definitions and block them. That's why you need something that's worth watching these advanced protection aspects as well. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Did I scroll all the way? Yeah, I did. You did. All right. All right. Well, I guess then um, I'll wrap it up, Mike. Um, I want to thank you again for taking us on the 40 adventure um, and for making this fun and interactive. Thanks to everybody for being here this morning and for your comments and feedback in the chat box. Uh, we have one more session this coming Thursday, the 29th. Um, and then we will be following up to uh, those with those who, who reach the criteria for the actual virtual wine tasting. So you'll be hearing from me personally about that. Um, and I just really appreciate everybody being here this morning. Yeah, and thank you everybody for me as well. It was nice to virtually see you all and I hope you learned something and enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Have a great day, everybody.